a series of videos on the fundamentals of pharmacokinetics. You will find these videos useful by themselves, but they are nevertheless best viewed alongside a textbook, Clinical Pharmacokinetics from the Beginning. It's available on Amazon and priced for a student budget. The textbook and these videos are themed around an imaginary drug called Pretendolone. Drug concentration time data are used to build a pharmacokinetic profile. If you want more information on how this works, see video one and introduction. Video 3B, the second video on elimination. Here we're going to cover the line of best fit and half-life. In the previous video, video 3A, we calculated the elimination rate constant, or K, for the oral dose of pretendolone. It was calculated between a drug concentration C1 at time T1 and a drug concentration C2 at time T2. This means that we calculated the elimination rate constant using two data points. The intermediate data points were ignored. Now for pretend alone, the elimination phase is very close to an ideal straight line on the semi-log plot. So using just two data points is probably acceptable. But what happens if the data points don't line up as well on the semi-log plot as they do for pretend alone? And to demonstrate this, I'm just going to arbitrarily move some of those data points around. The plot is now no longer an ideal straight line in the elimination phase. So ask yourself, would calculating the elimination rate constant between just two data points, C1 and C2, and ignoring the intermediate data points, would that be appropriate? And I suspect you would agree that it wouldn't be. So faced with data like this, probably the best approach is to use regression analysis to add a line of best fit to all the data points along the elimination phase. And that's what I've done here. That is the line of best fit using regression analysis. How I've done that will become apparent in just a moment. Regression analysis is a standard statistical technique so I don't want to go into any detail here, but let's just cover it literally in a nutshell. It's where you have scattered data points between an X and Y axis. You can add a line of best fit to those data. For each of the data points, you have the actual data point, which is designated as lowercase xi, and then the expected data point, that is the point along the line of best fit, designated as uppercase XI. If you then subtract lowercase XI from uppercase XI for all the data points and square it, then the sum is made to be the smallest number possible. And this is known as the residual sum of squares. Now, if you want to know more about this, I'll let you look it up for yourself. You can look up regression analysis and residual sum of squares, and you should be able to see how this technique works. Fortunately, we do not have to do a lot of calculation and mathematics to add a line of best fit because spreadsheet programs such as Excel will do it for you. You would plot the elimination phase on a semi-log plot in Excel and then use the menu to add a trend line. That trend line is shown here in the red line. 
because it's a semi-log plot, choose the exponential option and also display the equation. Here are our data with the data points moved around a little bit and that's the, the line of best fit and that is the equation there. You will remember the exponential equation introduced in video 3a. Well, you can see that the equation for the line of best fit is in exactly the same form as the exponential equation. And these are the terms here where they correspond. You can calculate a drug concentration from the y-axis for ever any given time point on the x-axis. So let's say x equals 15 hours. Feed x equals 15 into the equation and you will find y will give you a drug concentration of 16.35 nanograms per mil. The other really important point about this equation is that that exponent of E is the same as the elimination rate constant. And so, if we go back to our original pretend alone data and put in a line of best fit, you will find that the elimination rate constant using that method is 0 0.121. And you will remember from the previous video, we calculated the elimination rate constant as 0 0.122 using the two data points, C1, T1, C2, T2. So we end up with virtually the same result, which isn't surprising since pretend alone gives you a nice ideal straight line down the elimination phase. Now, many of the pharmacokinetic software programs calculate the elimination constant by regression analysis. They tend to do this behind the scenes. Remember that the elimination rate constant is used in the calculation of a number of other pharmacokinetic parameters, as you will see in future videos. And so it's always worth sense checking how it's derived which brings us to half-life. The elimination rate constant as a parameter is difficult to visualise, but the concept of half-life is much easier to grasp. This is why half-life is probably the most widely quoted pharmacokinetic parameter when it comes to elimination. Half-life is the time it takes for the drug concentration to fall by half. It has units of time, typically hours. It can be calculated for both the oral and intravenous dose. It can be calculated from the elimination rate constant. In fact, calculating half-life from the elimination rate constant is the preferred method, as you will see in a moment. But first, we're going to calculate half-life for the oral dose of pretendolone from the drug concentration time plot to demonstrate the principle. Here's the semi-log plot for the oral dose of pretendolone. And here is the table of data that go with that plot. Just as we did with elimination rate constant, we have to calculate the half-life along the elimination phase of that plot. So let's take four hours and a drug concentration of 65.71 nanograms per mil as our starting point. What we want to know is how long does it take for that drug concentration to fall by half? At 32.86 nanograms per mil, that coincides with 9.5 hours. Half that drug concentration, 
16.43 nanograms per mil coincides with 15 hours. Now you can get the time points simply by using a ruler on the plot and, and lining things up or alternatively you can go and use the exponential equation shown here. Either way you can see that the drug concentration is halving every 5.5 hours and so using the plot the half-life equals 5.5 hours. As I said previously, you can calculate half-life from the elimination rate constant. You do it from this equation. Where that equation comes from, we'll deal with that in just a minute. We know that the elimination rate constant for the oral dose of pretendolone is 0.122 per hour. And so from that equation, we know the half-life is 5.68. We can call it 5.7 hours. So from the graph, we had 5.5 hours. From the equation, we have 5.7 hours. Since our preferred method of calculating half-life is from the elimination rate constant, we will take the half-life of the oral dose of pretendolone as 5.7 hours. Where does that equation come from? It originates from the exponential equation first encountered in video 3. Let's remind ourselves of the terms. C2 is the drug concentration at time T2. C1 is the drug concentration at time T1, and K, of course, is the elimination rate constant. If we just pop the equation up in the corner to give ourselves some room. If we take the time T2 minus T1 and make that equal to the half-life, and we make C1 equal to 1, then after one half-life, the drug concentration C2 is going to be half of what it is at C1, hence it's going to equal 0.5. And so we can rewrite the equation 0.5 equals E to the power of minus K multiplied by the half-life. Now, without going through this step by step, we can rearrange the equation and express it in terms of half-life and we get this equation. Half-life equals the natural log of 2 divided by the elimination rate constant. That is the standard equation for calculating half-life from the elimination rate constant. So far we've only looked at the 50 milligram oral dose of pretendolone, we can do the same thing from the 2 milligram single intravenous dose of pretendolone. Here are the data for the intravenous dose, first shown in video 2, and that is the corresponding semi log plot. If we take drug concentration and time points from that plot, put it into our equation, we find that the elimination rate constant is 0 0.122 per hour. Now that number might be familiar because the elimination rate constant for both the oral and intravenous dose is the same. That means that the half-life for the oral an intravenous dose is the same, 5.7 hours. This is not that unusual because once the drug is in the plasma, the processes of elimination are the same irrespective of how the drug got into the plasma. So it's quite a common observation between oral and intravenous doses. There can, however, be exceptions, and there's more about this in the textbook. 
and we include some real drug examples of where things can go just a little bit wrong. To put half-life into context, here are some half-lives for three drugs. And you can see it's quite a, a wide range of times, ranging here from two hours up to five days. One other item of information that I just mentioned in passing, half-life depends upon clearance and volume of distribution. And this is explained in video 7b. What does half-life mean? Here is a semi-log plot. Um, just look at the y-axis. I put relative plasma drug concentration. You'll find out why in just a moment. There is a drug concentration below which a drug ceases to have any significant pharmacologic effect. If we take a drug like midazolam, it has a half-life of two hours. And we can compare that with a drug like diazepam that has a half-life of 43 hours. The actual concentrations of diazepam and midazolam are going to be different, which is why I've used relative drug concentration, just so you can compare the shape of the curves. Both midazolam and diazepam are benzodiazepines, but the duration of the pharmacologic effect for diazepam is much longer than it is for midazolam. This is why midazolam is used in short-term procedures, such as dentistry and colonoscopy, and diazepam is used where you want a much longer-acting effect, such as in sleep disorders. Now we'll meet half-life as an important parameter in repeat dosing regimens in later videos, video 8a and 8b, and we'll come back to a version of this plot in those videos. In the next video, that's video 4, we're going to approach the concept of exposure and the area under the drug concentration time curve. Hope to see you there.